im Netz, die Untold Stories. Eine Dia-Show der beiden Journalisten neben mir aus ihrem äh, Privatarchiven der letzten zwei Wochen. We're going to see a slideshow, a slideshow of the, uh, from the two journalists standing next to me. And uh, it's going to be IT history in the parts that they haven't published so far. We have Detlef Borjas who is a journalist and has been that since 86. And uh, one of the things he writes is the uh, Was war, was wird column at uh, heise.de. And Erich Möchel, who is a hacker. Let me start and uh, let me explain why we're here. During last camp, we uh, happened to meet for the first time. Peter and me wrote for the same newspaper in the 80s. Detlev um, has been there for ages and we met and we spent the entire afternoon uh, right uh, next to where we stand now. And we uh, simply chatted, we had fun, and initially there were five people next to us, then there were ten, and after two hours there was a crowd of 30 people listening. And uh, so we told ourselves we're going to have to give a talk at the next camp. And those of you who say uh, Grandad is speaking about the crypto wars, uh, crypto wars, um, <laughs> you're going to have to deal with me. Um, so yes, we uh, decided we would have to come up on stage here. Peter unfortunately couldn't make it due to an illness. He's doing fine, but I think he's a bit exhausted after the documentary they uh, filmed with him on uh, Vau Holland. And that explains this slightly absurd picture. So um, Detlef Borchers can take it from here with the first episode of the untold story. It's an untold story because there were certain things that we researched back in the days, but we couldn't publish them. Does anybody know this person? This is Frank Gerard Riemann. He was uh, he used to be a deputy president of the CCC and um, became president later on. And the reason I'm showing you Frank is this. Beside the Datenschleuder magazine that uh, was published on paper, he also uh, founded the Schadisti and distributed it in various networks, for example in GeoNet, where it could be found uh, under the command board CCC Press. And this electronic newspaper made by hackers uh, talked about cryptography and this is going to be one of the main subjects today. Yeah. Don't you dare. Yes, because uh, crypto is back on the table with the uh, debates on uh, the restrictions on cryptography. Each issue of uh, Chadisi ended with this um, imprint which is uh, what uh, really defines the CCC today. The entire humanity is, I'm sorry. Does any of you know this person? It's Günther Leuev who is holding a t-shirt. Why is he holding it? He is the person who ran the GeoNet mail system, which you can see in the background. And when this picture was taken, he was um, named honorary president of the Chaos Computer Club. Now there are other people standing in his place. You might know them better. Andy on one side, Vau on the other side, and Günther Loyal with the diploma that certifies that he has become honorary president. Why did he become that? He founded a uh, club, an association, 
or uh, telecommunication and everybody who wanted to do things with data on the internet could become member of this association they had to submit an application and when you did that you were you had uh, legal protection for your mailbox and this made him honorary president. This is the first part of my stories. This happened in the year of 1988. And I will jump ahead to the years of 89 and 90. I um, was uh, newly employed at the Austrian Standard newspaper. I got my own column on uh, media and I uh, often went on holiday and thank God we had uh, Dreisat television and the news over here so I could report while I was here without, without uh, the company being any the wiser and I uh, loaned one of these things, the, uh, the newspaper had three of them. They had uh, three Toshiba laptops in black and white with uh, two floppy drives, one for the operating system and one for memory. And I had, had that and I had this acoustic coupler and uh, that allowed me to send over my uh, texts. So we were on the Rammstein Air Base and we were there quite often. And we said we'd we'd go to the airbase. And my friend Axel was there with a lot of punks, and that's uh, how things got started. We were completely stoned from the very beginning, and uh, in these higher spheres, and behind us, the military police was constantly watching what we were doing. We weren't really planning on doing anything. Uh, talking about the cops, the usual. And I had my acoustic coupler, coupler and a laptop, and then I saw this telephone booth. And I thought I could try field reporting with this crap. So I entered the booth and uh, told the guys, um, give me some cover, make sure that the cops can't see me. So I went, uh, went in, uh, threw in five one-mark pieces, put this on the coupler, and when it started making uh, the usual noises, the, uh, sending the ACK for the connection, <laughs> the acoustic coupler flew through the air and I was thrown backwards out of the telephone booth and found myself uh, next to two American uh, military policemen who uh, took me away and I uh, had to answer questions for one hour. I was completely out of it. I only had some slippers, of course no uh, press card, nothing, and I, I was telling them I was trying field reporting, so they let me go after one hour because the punks were standing outside and saying if Erich comes out, doesn't come out soon, we'll come in. That was the first, my first meeting with the German and American police at the very time, very same time, and I uh, hand over to Detlef. A short English insert. This is in yellow because the company had yellow as its color. Lotus Notes, it was the Lotus color. Now we're in the year 1996 and Lotus back then had the so-called, ran the so-called Lotus, Lotus Government Forum and uh, a Lotus person stood up and said there is information superiority and that is what we have to use. It was the time of the Bosnian conflict and we'll tell Milosevic exactly that what we do and what information we have about him and that will make him see that we are much stronger and he will desist and that will prevent a war. There was lots of applause for that, but it turned out quite differently. 
You have to think back to the Kosovo conflict where Milosevic simply didn't hesitate at all. He just kicked off that war. And this is my explanation from an article. Knowledge management was supposed to strengthen the German forces as a peace corps, but there was a disadvantage. Lotus Notes did encrypt, but not sufficiently for inner American use. They were using 128 bits, but the Europeans only received Lotus Notes with a version, a version that used 50 bits, or was it 56? That was important because the German authority had 60,000 licenses, and up to the year 2003, they were going to equip use 80,000 of these uh, licenses for this product. And that, and the minister or the ministry, the civil servants responsible for acquisition, uh, this was in 1997, went ahead and said, this is completely unacceptable to us. If we are going to use a software that the NSA can control, that is just not on for the German military. But he left open how this was going to be secured, but the response clearly was, no, the, the, the message clearly was we want to be safe from the NSA. And it has to be said, this forum for NATO and the military consultants well, was intended for NATO and military consultants. I was not going to report, I wasn't supposed to report on this. I, I went to the meeting about information superiority, uh, where this concept was discussed. But I, I wasn't admitted and just stayed in the room after another talk and could hear and, and record and, and take papers with me. That is another section and I'm going to move back, give it back to Eric. The key word is take papers with you. That will have a play a role later on. In 1995 and 96, in February 1995, I went, I became a World Wide Web enthusiast, spent three months there until one of my friends showed me trace route and other commands and then I said, just tell, don't tell me that this is all going to be transmitted in clear text. And he said, yes, of course it is. It's all in clear. And I said, are you crazy? That is less safe than a letter. Yes. Well, he said, we just won't have time to, to read this all. Transmits far too fast. It's all growing. Bandwidth is growing much faster than storage capabilities. So that's how they convinced themselves. And then in 1996, I was presented an online magazine, which was run by three techies. And they simply ran out of content. They underestimated the amount of work it takes to run such a publication that it has to appear. And that it's a heap of work. So, as a result, from a merely entertaining magazine, it was swiftly converted to a civil rights magazine. And in 1997, this magazine had, it was raided, much like the raid on CompuServe in Munich. This provider there was raided and the servers were taken out from away from the shelves while they were running because they were uh, carrying Usenet groups and because perhaps some something like sex or something appeared in there as well. And of course then we called this Kotan is investigating on the internet, Kotan being a famous Austrian satire of a, of a crime uh, series. And the internet actually in Austria Austria, for a whole night, the internet was simply reduced to zero. Everything that was on the internet, on the internet was taken down. That ha never happened again. And something else we did 
if cryptography is a weapon, then we will start a weapons store. This was supposed to be an animated GIF, and we called this. Uh, we announced an award for clogged up lines, which didn't make many people happy, but people said, well, I just told them, fuck yourself, that's my answer to this. If someone tells me to stop something, then I'll respond. I wasn't going to say this, I intended to say, please just walk off, but that's what I actually did say. So, Quintessence suddenly became a member of the Global Internet Campaign, the magazine, and cryptography was the sole topic all of a sudden, and we were all waiting until the first GUI version of PGP would come out, which didn't exist at the time, that was a very fresh project. And on the Global Internet Liberty campaign mailing list, you had everyone that had rank and name worldwide, it wasn't just something small. And everywhere they were looking for the OECD recommendations for cryptography, which was in the last draft stages. And I in Vienna, and I will come to this in the next section. Suddenly, data protector Hans Zeger came to us. He started in 1983 with protecting data. He's one of the very old school protect, uh, data privacy activists. And he came to me and put this on my desk. This here. This. He had the OECD papers, which everyone was looking for. And I said, wow, where did you get these, Hans? These are confidential papers, no one will get them. The only person who had them wasn't allowed to give them away. And Sega then said, well, I took it from the Chancellor's office in Austria, and I said, what? Why? Well, I just went there to Dr. So-and-so, who has something to do with data protection, and he had this lying there, and at the end of the talk he said, by the way, doctor, could you perhaps have a look at this? We don't really know what to do with this. We don't have the knowledge, and that's how the papers came to me. He had a Mac and he knew OCR. So these 120 pages were OCR'd and I proofread the OCR which, because it was very buggy at the time. So I knew these, I learned, I wrote, learned the, the papers because I received it twice. And, and there was, was a lot of a diplomatic rows as a consequence. And, for the, and at the second instance, we published this online and said this is a small service for the delegates so that they can access the document whenever they want in electronic form. Yeah, and we actually wrote amendments too. So that's my introduction into the world of cryptography. Back to Detlef. In 1997, we had a minister whose name was Kanter, Manfred Kanter, and he gave a speech in Bonn on the uh, <laughs> Federal Information Security Offices uh, conference. And what did he say? He said, if in several years the Internet will not be encrypting only normal data traffic, but even uh, regular phone calls, then this is, then uh, we need regulation to prevent <laughs> law enforcement's uh, abilities for wiretapping um, from being impossible. So um, this would essentially render the state powerless. So what else did he say? It's very simple. This can be done by <laughs> giving, by handing the uh, encryption keys to a state organization. 
and using uh, personal, organizational and legal measures to prevent uh, any ability for abuse. This is not about wiretapping. We have to have surveillance measures, is what he said, and uh, the honest citizen will deliver their encryption keys. He didn't stay in office for long. The very next year he was replaced by a person from the Free Democratic Party, and that was Günther Rechtsroth, a very uh, a uh, person very sympathetic to uh, the uh, to <laughs> private companies, uh, he said we need s strong crypto. Another thing that I forgot, Kai Rohrbacher, after this speech, uh, set up a mailing list where everybody met and um, emailed back and forth the papers they had. Among these, the Cantor speech. And the mailing list was at a certain. It, there, there was a certain shift in mentality and uh, zeitgeist because people didn't know what a mailing list was. But this uh, mailing list was used to spread these things, and there was jubilation when Kanter said this. The American organization should have uh, access at any time. Uh, this is also true for foreign entities. This is unacceptable. Be the technical measures to protect yourselves with a strong cryptographic method are freely available in Germany. Boom, we've defined crypto as a uh, legal measure both for private economy and individual citizens. In 89, the, in 99, the uh, federal government lined out the uh, cornerstones of crypt the German crypto policy. They're very hard to find on the internet these days. At least the uh, Ministry for the Economy doesn't have them. Kai Raven's homepage, which is ancient, still has them. It's got the last revision of these cornerstones, and he froze them, and it will stay there. The reason I mention this is that at the uh, previous camp, Netzpolitik.org sent a uh, question to the government and asked them, what about crypto? And the answer was in 2015 that uh, the cornerstones of German crypto policy from 1999 still apply and uh, strong crypto is legal. This was it. That was the Vassana arrangement. There's a picture of it. And let's start like this. Through the Vassana office, which is the office where crypto was held hostage, it was the office that defined export restrictions. And uh, a successor to the uh, sanctions on Russia when you were no longer allowed to export computers to Russia. And it contained the munitions list, so material that can be weaponized, and that included cryptography. And of course, uh, we were aghast at this. And Global Internet Liberty Campaign. Uh, the, I saw that this office is in Vienna. It's behind the Hotel Bristol, which is a very fancy, fancy hotel next to the state opera. The Vassana office at, is at the back side of this. My brother was very much into secret services. He knew about this, and he told me that this was um, where the British secret service had their offices after the war, and I thought, hmm, I should be able to have access to this. And the Canadians and Mark Rottenberg knew two people from, well, who 
Bürokraten. Well, bureaucrats who had uh, passed these, this arrangement and I uh, gave them a call and said I'm a reporter and I noticed that in 1996 there was one message or one uh, notification that this office was being opened and that was it. Nobody knew of it here. And I asked the others, do you know anybody who works there? Yes, there's one who he works for the telecoms industry, he's from Canada, he's not a spook. So uh, it was a meeting point for uh, military secret services, but he's not a spook. And I gave them a call. I uh, was when I was still writing for Telepolis and not Future Zone. So I said, I'm a reporter, I would like to visit you. I would like to have a look. People can't really paint a picture of this and there are rumors going about so we could use it as an opportunity to correct them. So they said, yes, um, <laughs> come along. And so we we had a look and I know what the architecture there is like. And it, it's true, they live in the Bristol Hotel and there's a uh, there's a path right into the building. They don't really use the door. They also have their own garage with their own security, and you can only get upstairs with a guarded lift. And I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. That was the office where cryptography was being held hostage. That's the entrance door. Maler Straße 14. On the right-hand side is the state opera, and this is their doorbell. At the bottom is the uh, Afghan consulate, and the Vasana office is not here, because it is top seven and top eight, even today. This was, it was the same in uh, 98. So I went in, uh, went out, wrote an article on uh, Vasana, and I was giving a speech on this topic anyway in Frankfurt at the Heinrich Böll Foundation and that's where I met Wau. And we spent ages until three in the morning we were talking about short wave and I said <laughs> ham radio operators are assholes and he said no not everybody and I told him about how I was not allowed to uh, do the exam because I had been intercepting illegal things they didn't allow me to take the exam the next morning I flew home I had uh, I had a sore head. I was uh, boarding the plane on the other side of the galley, and in the last, mis last minute, um, this businesswoman was coming along and sat down next to me. And I was wondering what she was doing in the smoker seat. And she told me about how she had to sit next to the galley because she had medicine that needed to be cold, chilled, and apart from that she would like a cigarette, and I was wondering what she wanted from me, and I gave her a cigarette, she smoked it, and I saw that she's not a smoker. It didn't take a very long time until we started talking, then I asked her, why she was flying to Vienna, and she told me she's, she's leading a session at the Wassenaar office. Do you know what I did? I was slightly surprised. And this is a great recipe for you if you ever get spoken to like this. During the communication, I gave a, a, an incredibly brutal history from my private life where I uh, made a fool of myself. And 
She was astonished. This was it, because I did it instinctively. And that was the uh, lady. I didn't dare mention it at the time because everybody who didn't understand my reporting said I was paranoid and these are conspiracy theories and whatnot. And if I then say that I was I was in the Vassana office another time with a person from the Elect Electronic Frontier Foundation and I asked the two people who were there, one of them from the uh, German Secret Service who was uh, not very nice to me, the other was a friendly Canadian and I asked them, do you know uh, uh, Luzi, Luisa Maria Colon from uh, Puerto Rico? I looked at them like this and they said, yes, we know uh, Louisa who is from the State Department, isn't she? And I said, it's because she sat next to me on the plane and uh, started talking, talking to me. And uh, the Canadian asked me uh, if I was surprised by the directness of the approach and smiled very kindly. Over to Detlef. In 1999, there was a conference of the Global Internet Project, uh, which I couldn't find on net online anymore, but this is the folder for the conference, and that was the main sponsor. All the big cryptographers, Diffie, uh, whoever was there, you can see this extract from the participant list, uh, and the person that you were always quarreling with was, was there. Who was that? Uh, and they talked about things like key escrow and Americans wanted uh, to establish a key escrow procedure. That was a private conference uh, in London. Uh, there was a pho photography prohibition. I did try to subvert that without a flash, of course, because the OECD guidelines suddenly Erich had published them, of course. All participants had them and, and were given them these guidelines now. And they were supposed to be discussed. And uh, a statement, everyone had a statement. Ulrich Sandel from the Economic, Economic Ministry, Ministry for Germany, he, he supported the Rexroth position. We will not make key escrow. The economy needs strong crypto. The OECD person that had compiled these papers was then giving the presentation and the speaker of the British communication ministry tried to explain key escrow as a technology that was friendly towards civil society that could be rolled out and from that conference I was not allowed to f take photos, but I was allowed to write about it. So, as a journalist, uh, we were supposed to make the key escrow procedure known and favored with the public. And now I will move, take a very different step and hand back to Erich. You have another slide on this. Yes, now this is a small story. How in 2001, in the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, I became a persona non grata. I had published the OECD papers at Telepolis and others, the Interpol papers, and, and, and the, this was just requirements to the COPS by the COPS toward telecoms, how they were supposed to set things up so that eavesdropping would be possible and recording. And now this landed in the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, and that uh, then was handed over to the security working group. They didn't even call it lawful interception at the time. So I, was, I saw there that, there were, that all the people in there allegedly were part of industry, but in fact they had they had they put forward secret service positions 
much against the interests of industry, and the head, Robin Gape, was most conspicuous there. So I thought, that's impossible, he can't be from Telecom. And then calls for this and that to be surveilled. These were all undercover people, and no one admitted where they came from. They were all economic ministries, regulators, or things like that, or from private companies. But the whole group was set up in this way. Many people were in there, and all of them were not what they pretended to be. So I simply published all their names. That was a four-part publication at CT. The it's the dossiers. I put all the names in there <coughs> without, <coughs> without mercy. And I had a very good source because a certain telecoms company had no interest on, in the Etsy interfaces because they had different ones and didn't want to change their network. So there was a kind of support. And I always published it as soon as I got it. And then these people got enraged. Of course, I provoked this, I took their names and said, come on, people, does anyone know these people? I would soon like to publish non-public documents and if anyone can give me any information, We'll, give, we'll be given insight. So someone from the BBC wrote to me and said, I was in university with them. They were always close to the state and this and that and that guy, I knew. So I gave him those documents. Conference scrambling for safety in London 2000. First speaker, Ross Anderson, and second me. Ross about crypto and me about Bill. And as soon as I came in, that British journalist said, careful, your friends are here. They were up in the gallery, the five of them, and were not positive, and, and everyone saw that they were together, and I received the next stash of papers, ne next batch, and I noticed that there was a four-page dossier about me in them. That was funny, and of course, it said this document is not to be made publicly available, so I immediately took it and put it up there and at Cryptome. Und da haben sie the die and Falle gelaufen. That's where they were trapped in the Streisand trap. Because they had all their names all spelled out. All the ones that I had been so mean to publish. So I took those documents and republished published it on Cryptome again and suddenly they had announced their own names. And then the accusation came that I was conducting harassment. Come on, there are spooks in there working under a false ID and I just publish the names and I am the one that's scaring them? Come on, I'm not scaring anyone. That was just ridiculous. And then they got the idea that this were not all non-published documents because these were all that, that all these internal documents had been published on Krypton that they hadn't seen. So that made them that annoyed them even more and they wanted then to, to use copyright to get at me and, and then these idiots suddenly noticed that, that a standardization institute is work, works on open standards and that open standards, everyone has to sign their copyright interests away by working on these open standards. They had an interest in those and without them the net cannot grow. So they realized that the copyright uh, thing wasn't going to really work and from then on somehow everything somehow was over. They didn't want me anymore at all. I quite understood and for their pleasure I presented them the 5G surveillance talk because there's some of these people are still in there and I say this is a small service to these people themselves so that they can see what it, what nonsense they are doing to uh, sum up we thought we'd uh, take a leap back into the past where 
we were confronted with this technology for the first time. When I was finishing my studies, I uh, was <laughs> transferred to, a, to an institute in Bagnolet uh, near Paris, where we um, published this publication, and uh, the two chairman of this institute, whom you can see on this cover as the editor, and uh, Amon is a fascinating guy, I had a lot of fun with him, and he's Belgian, and he was <laughs> Minister for Culture under Allende in Chile, and the entire diaspora of the Chilean left gathered around him regularly, and I was among them, and met a guy whose name is uh, Guy Bonzipe, but he turned out to be a German designer from Tübingen in southwest Germany. And together with Guy, I talked about uh, kibernet cybernetics because that was his passion. He uh, designed this room as a, well, as a central uh, Chilean uh, uh, operating central of the Chilean economy. And this was where they would determine the production numbers for the Chilean economy and this would be distributed throughout the country through a computer network. He uh, developed, de developed all this and this is what it, the individual screens looked like. I mean, this is a mock-up, but Bonziepe tried to develop a system for a cybernetic planned economy, and it's fascinating what I was uh, allowed to learn back in the days. So that was my introduction, that was in 82 or 83, and that's where I got my uh, first computer as well. Thank you, Detlef. In 2000, I uh, got a visit from Nicky Hager from New Zealand. Do you know who he is? He, he uh, got started on the Echelon scan standard in 96 by re-engineering the entire network, starting from the uh, Waiopai Echelon station, and he searched for the communication satellites along the equator and said there has to be one on Ascension Island and another on Madeira, otherwise you couldn't get them. That's what started the investigation in the European Parliament. Parliament in 2000, and he came up to me. Because his name is not Nicky Hager, his name is Nicky Hager, and his dad was Viennese until 38. And the son came back, and I knew him from the mailing lists, and said, come, come to me, you can stay at my place. I have a huge uh, house in the countryside. Um, he came with his daughter. We talked about God in the world, and uh, he gave me documents. He told me things. I gave him documents. He didn't. He told me things I didn't know. And then we started talking about shortwave, the same as with Vow back in the day. And I said, No, he said, I intercepted all these telecoms, and I got. Um, replies from all of them, because the engineers had the same hobbies and nobody knew that I was only 16. They thought I was a telecoms engineer, the same as them. So I got, for example, this from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where they wrote what kind of antennae they had and uh, why they were transmitting, or the US Coast Guard sent me uh, a really nice letter or this. this. He asked, do you have anything from New Zealand? I said, yes, one. That was the last thing I got because I moved to a different place where antennae were no longer an option. And this was a hand-typed letter from the communications engineer of the naval station 
Radio Irirangi. Uh, he started laughing. Nikki Hager started laughing. He wished me good DX. He was from the uh, same trade as we, and he thought I was a telecoms engineer even though I was still at school. And Nikki Hager burst out laughing and said, this isn't possible. Radio Iri Rangi, that's the, daughter's, uh, the sister station of the Waihopai Echelon station. And uh, it sent shivers down my spine. Thank you. Thank you. It's OK. Is it all right? Vielen, vielen Dank. Thanks so much, Erich and Detlef. We are available for your questions. Hal Faber. Hal Faber.